What's up, everybody? Let's just pretend that first one didn't happen. You guys doing all right today? Good, 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 good. My name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, man, we had a phenomenal day yesterday at our Hope in the Age of Addiction conference at Tremont Temple Baptist Church. Had a phenomenal turnout for a very special guest who we are fortunate to have again with us this morning. And so Dr. Chip Dodd, his experience with addiction and recovery motivated him to dedicate his life to help others move into the lives that God created them for. In 1985, he graduated with his master's degree in English from the University of Mississippi and earned his Ph.D. in counseling from the University of North Texas in 1990. In 1991, he developed the spiritual root system, a simple and effective way to help people understand that we are created as emotional and spiritual creatures created to live fully through relationship with ourselves, others, and God. Building on this foundation, in 1996, he founded the Center for Professional Excellence, which is a treatment center that has helped thousands get recovery of their hearts. And in 2003, he founded Sage Hill, a social impact organization dedicated to helping people see who they were made to be so that they can do what they were made to do. He is an author of multiple books, including Voice of the Heart and Hope in the Age of Addiction. He's been married to his wife, Sonia, since 1983. Can I get an amen? You know what I'm saying? That's pretty awesome. And so his, he has two grown sons. He was a blessing to us yesterday. We had a great time with him in the first service. Dr. Chip Dodd, my friend, my man, would you come up here and bless us again? Very good. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Matt. Matt, you've had to do a lot of that over a period of 24 hours. <laughs> I asked Matt today to, yesterday, I said, I want you to show this clip, but I'm going to do a few minute kind of like intro, <clears throat> you know, kind of like setting everything up as a preface. <clears throat> and uh, an hour, 10 minutes later, he was sitting down up there going like, I guess he forgot it. It took an hour and 10 minutes to get going. So I want you to know, I know you're hungry for lunch. Uh, it's going to happen. We, your lunch is coming. And I, I, I will not do what I did yesterday. But thank you, Matt. Thank you, Aaron, and everybody who participates with them. It was, it's been amazing, your kindness and hospitality. And someone said, I know you people in Tennessee, that's where I'm from, uh, you're known for hospitality, but we're, we're tougher, but we do it too. You know, so, so y'all have been so kind. And I love the accent. Y'all have an accent? And... Uh, <laughs> This guy told me, exactly, the guy told me yesterday, y'all have the original accent, y'all, you're the original, you know, and uh, I was so impressed how so many people understood me yesterday. I came in speaking this foreign language, you know, Southern, and, uh, and all these people from the South came and said, well, I, I get you, I get you. I'm like, good, it feels like being at home. Uh, Aaron gave me permission to do a little switcheroo, and I'm going to, um, because it's just important. And so uh, what I'm going to do, we're going to see a, a, a short clip from a movie, Braveheart. But I, for those of you who have pens, I really want you to write some stuff down today. More than story, I want you to gather up some stuff that I want you to look at later. Because I want you to ponder it. I want you to linger on it later. Um, but, but the application today that I want you to take out of here is that you continue to allow yourselves to grow in this equation to allow yourselves to grow in this equation I'm going to give you. And the equation is uh, H period, O period, W period. It's an acronym, you know, set up like, uh, it means honest, open, and willing. Honest is being able to tell the truth about yourself. It doesn't mean you're, you're being really good at telling other people they don't, they're not doing right. Honest doesn't mean that you're good at pointing at other people. Honest means you're good at telling the truth about yourself. So honest, open, which means that you're not defensive, you're capable of receiving information or feedback from others, and willingness is allowing your heart to take a risk again in spite of past occurrences. You got me? Because we were born full-hearted, all in. You probably were never more courageous than at birth. 
Because courage means full-hearted participation. You can't even help yourself. You can't even think. You can't talk. But you're all in. Doing exactly what you were created by creation and the creator to do. To attach, join, live fully, be known, be cared for. And y'all who I'm attaching to, y'all grow me into exactly what we're going to do here. And also, I didn't know this when you were an infant. You didn't know it when you were an infant. But you also were going to have to be introduced to a great grief. That what you're looking for that's been written in your heart called eternity ain't here. Isn't here. Like, oh, so not only am I going to be introduced to the joy of being with you, I'm going to be introduced to the sorrow of where I live. And if you don't introduce me to the sorrow where I live while keeping the joy of living with me and you, then I'm going to lose a lot. And the thing I'm going to lose is heart. I'm going to lose heart. I'm going to lose courage. Courage means full-hearted participation. All in. So that what many of us have to do, in fact, I would say all of us have to do, we have to come back to that song, My trust is in you, I will not be shaken. That's something we return to, and we maybe do it some days, most days, occasionally, (laughs) because there's a world that screams a testimony against the witness of that song. There's a world that screams not true, not so, and there is a world where it isn't so, and I say, so, so what? What are we going to do? Now, so honest, open, and willing, are you willing to take a risk even though you have a testimony, a background, and a history that says, I wouldn't do that if I were you. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't risk that. Don't you know what happens when you put your hand out? Uh, Not much comes back. Wish in one hand, cry on the other one. See which one gets filled up fastest. That's kind of like the philosophy of life, and we know those philosophies better than we know this truth. I mean, we know the sayings about how to survive better than we know the the sayings and truths and the Holy Spirit's words about how to live. Like, don't cry over spilled milk. If you can't run with uh, big dogs, get on the porch. If you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. It's what goes around, comes around. It all comes out in the pull yourself up by your Well, there you go. Now we've got our philosophy of life right here in this room called the Holy Church of God. And we believe in those sayings more than we believe in these truths. And we know those sayings of survival better than we know and trust the words of thriving. Because we have not found the words of thriving to actually meet us where we really live. Okay? And we're going to talk about what those words are and get back to taking our words back today. Now, So honest, open, and willing, willing is taking a chance again. And every single person who is in recovery, recovery from what ails you. Now, guys, that's a big tent. You don't have to be alcoholic, drug addicted to suffer from something that ails you that you need recovery from. Called distrust, suspicion, people pleasing, approval seeking, caretaking others, achievement orientation, climbing the ladder of success only to find there's more ladder but you don't know where to go and you know the fall's a long way. What do I do? Okay, so we know that a lot better than we know the truth of this. So in recovery, uh, your recovery from what ails you, you're also after recovery of who you're made to be, who you were born to be, who God created you to be, which is a return to courage. It's also a return to hope. It's a return to faith even because in some ways no more than ever before, and I know you don't have a, something to compare it against when you're born, but faith is a, 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 a certain of what you hope for, sure of what you hope for, and certain of what you do not see. When you come out of the womb, man, you are all sure about what you hope for, and you're certain of who you haven't seen yet. There you are. Let's do this. Attachment. I mean, we're made for attachment. We're made for each other. And God created us made for relationship and to find fulfillment in that connection. I mean, there's no getting away from it because everybody's attached to something. Either you're attached to those sayings that are a fool's paradise, you know, all comes out in the wash, man, and you live by that, or you're attached to the truths that feed us and grow us into who we're made to be again 
Everybody's attached to something. You're either attached to your faith as in that which keeps you from having to experience honesty, open, and willingness, or you're attached to the honest, open, and willingness on some level. So that's part of the equation. The second part of the equation, plus H-O-W plus G-O-D. G-O-D is good, orderly direction, okay? You seek people who have what you want, and you ask them how they got there, okay? Now, what that means is more than likely they're going to tell you, look, all I know is this is where I was, this is what's happened, and this is where I am now. And I'm going to point you towards, I'm going to tell you what they told me, and I found it to be true. In other words, nobody has the claim on it so that we have to climb up to a mountain to go get the Maharashi or so and so or whatever, and he can give us the words of wisdom showing a mirror in our face or something. You know, that, that, that the truth is being lived out on the sidewalks of everybody around us who has it. And somebody gave it to them, and they can't help but want to give it to somebody else because they once were lost and now they're saved. They were blind and now they see. Those are the people we need to seek out for good orderly direction because they had lost something and found it. They were blinded by something and see it. They were dead and they're alive again. So do you know the blind man in the book of John who had no education is saying the same thing that St. Paul tells us in 13 books of the New Testament. Both were blind and now they see. It just so happened that Paul had so much of an education, he had more to say about it. But the blind man said the same thing. Look, I was blind, and now I see. This is where I was. This is what happened, and this is where I am now. Do y'all want to meet who did it? That's, that's all he said. Then they started slapping around, spitting on him, told him to get out. <laughs> I mean, they roughed him up by just honest, open, by being honest, open, and willing, and by seeking good orderly direction. He got beaten up. But Paul's doing the same thing. He's saying, except he's got a lot more background to, to do more with it, but he's saying, this is where I was, this is what happened, this is where I am now. I'm doing the same thing. It's amazing. Okay. So, with that said, good oil direction is greater than, so the math teacher's in here, there's an arrow pointing that way. So, H-O-W plus G-O-D is greater than E-G-O. Easing God out. E-G-O is easing God out. And that's the faces we wear to hide our hearts. And that's even the faces we wear behind our faces to hide ourselves from our hearts. I mean, I want you to know that we can be extremely defensive creatures once we have been put into situations when we were helpless and no help came. And when we were slipping away in hope and we were barely clinging and what we decided to hope in was ourselves. And hoping in ourselves turns into hoping into something that would keep me from vulnerability and let me depend upon something else that I have hope in, like control, power, people-pleasing, manipulation, deceit, um, being truthful, being good, being caring, being achieving, being educated, all these other things instead of having to depend upon how I was created. And I was created to seek life and have it to the full. And Jesus said, I came to give life and that to the full. But the deceiver is a thief, is a destroyer and a killer. A killer of what? How we're created, what we're created for, and what we're created to do. A killer. And wants you to hide behind the EGO, the face. Hide, use your face to hide your heart. Instead of let, letting yourself dare to let your face show your heart. Because I'm telling you, people are walking along and they're looking around. Does anybody get what it's like to be inside me? People are walking around all over the place. Do you get what it's like to be inside me? And that's what Paul means when he said, no longer look at anybody from a worldly point of view. You look at them from the standpoint of your experience in life, and you look for maybe that they may be a brother or sister with you, or there may be somebody that needs you. You look at them past their skin, past their cars, past their clothes. You look in to see if there's anybody in there. See if there's something that says, we're familiar to each other. And I'm telling you, the power of a smile, the power of hello, the power of kindness either makes people mad, you know, like, you don't mean that, or it, it makes people safe and, and, and think they might be cared about. I love, we got a place, burrito place in uh, Tennessee called Moe's. And do y'all have one here? Okay. What do they say when you walk in? Welcome to Moe's. I'm like, all right. You know, and I go into Publix, a grocery store, and they go, welcome to Publix. I'm like, I'll be back. I mean, I've been invited and there's something that just, I just love an invitation. 
I saw love and invitation I don't have to do. In other words, that invitation is not a command to have to or else. It's like you're invited. And believe it or not, we have a God that really celebratory, in a celebratory way, he's saying to us, don't miss this. Don't miss this. I know what the world's doing, but I'm telling you, underneath what the world's doing, there is me. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. I mean, I don't want to say that God's a little bitty like a puppy, but I'm telling you, I believe there's that kind of excitement in God about us. Come on, come on, come on. I know what the world's doing, but you come on. And, and it's like running around, it's celebratory. But God says don't miss it twice. In the Psalms of Ascent from 120 to 134, that's the message. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. And then, don't miss this. Don't miss this. You miss this, you're missing everything. Everything you were born to have, everything you were born to be. And I know what the world is like. That's why I come, I came, that's how come I came to do something about it. So that the invitation can get to you directly. And you don't have to miss it anymore. You can have it back the way you're made to be, what you're made to live like. Okay, so it's greater than ego. Now, guys, when a shell falls to the ground, a seed falls to the ground and dies, what dies? Well, what dies is the shell so that the seed can be released. What dies in us is the ego so that who God made can be freed. Because, guys, if I were about really ego, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be standing here. reason I say that is because I'd be home where you couldn't talk about me and you couldn't look at me. Like, Because if you can look at me and you see me, you look at me, you can judge me, you can assess me, you can look at me from a worldly point of view, you can criticize me, you can, you can give me grades, you can tear me to pieces, you can uh, laugh at me, you can go home and you can mock me because I was one showing myself and you don't get to mock you because you didn't do anything. You see what I'm saying? So it's like in a lot of ways, it's like, uh, gosh, it's like I'm in danger. Well, where is my security that allows me to be in danger? Because I have people who I can go home to no matter what the danger is because I'm in relationship with the God who I trust and I will not be shaken, though I will get hurt, though I will be sad, though I will be lonely, though I will be joyful, though I will be fearful, but I will not go backwards. How come? Because going backwards is going back to where I came from and I'm not going back. Do you get that? Where the world does what the world does and I do not live there anymore. Where you live. <laughs> I want to go there. <laughs> I hope it's not in Tennessee, right? I want to stay in Boston, but it's right here. Now, so there's, there's the application. I took all that time to give you the end of the story. This is what you've got to do. This is what you're going to apply. And if you do, your life will get better. It's a promise. Because you will be introduced to how you were born again. Wait, born again? Yeah. You'll be introduced to how you were born again. And so you can be born anew every day. Okay? Because you're created for connection. And there's nothing to stop that. However, we have experienced a lot of things that stop that. If you were not truly welcomed into the world from the inside out by the people you were made to be with, then all of a sudden you're going like, am I mistaken? And finally you come up with the idea that I must be mistaken. And that's called toxic shame, but I'm, I'm mistaken. I, how I'm created with this courage and this faith and this hope and this willingness to work now, work is a beautiful thing. A child comes into life working just absolute, full blast, naked, uh, pedal to the metal work because they give their hands, their head, and the heart to everything they're doing. Little babies will start here and crawl out the door, army crawl, and go down the stairs looking for stuff. <laughs> right? You, you know what I'm saying? It's like, we don't do that. Like, that, that's too much energy. They go over and put their fingers in light sockets to see what it'll do. They're wanderers. You know, they're looking, they're, 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 they're passion-filled. They're willing to be in pain for something that matters more than pain because that's how they're born. Like, I'm in. And then all of a sudden, they don't get rewarded, reinforced. They don't get honored. Honored for how they're made. Instead, the word changes into, you honor my misinterpretation of life 
over how God created you to be honored, to be crowned with glory and honor as my creation. If you're not raised in a world where the people around you don't, if they don't know that you are fearfully, wonderfully made, knitted together in your mother's womb, exactly with the details of how you're created to be, if they don't honor that, then you become suspicious of, of uh, maybe you're made wrong. And that's where ego starts to be built and the true self starts to recede. And there's a great, great tragedy in that. And we think that's all there is to life when actually that's us buying into the tragedy over how we're created. Now, God asked a question in the beginning of Genesis, the very beginning of Genesis 3, 9. Everything had crashed. By the way, God didn't crash it. We crashed it. Let Aaron show you, continue to show you the original, the original story. The original story is it's that he didn't do it. We did it. We ran away when we needed to speak up. We were silent when we needed to cry out. We hid out instead of crying out. The birth of the ego. Hide my heart. And, and instead of learning from it and uh, uh, growing from it, we ran from it. Like Rafiki talks about Simba and Lion King. You know, he says, you can run from it or learn from it. You can run from the past or learn from the past, right? And I'm here to show us how to learn from the past. All right, now, so ego by dispensing with it is a scary deal because you've been hurt by in your life by not having it. So I wanna offer a caveat. There are people you do not share your heart with. They do not care. <laughs> in fact, if you do share your heart with them, they're gonna steal everything you've got. And then they're gonna destroy everything you brought and then they're gonna kill you, okay? Get in your car and leave. And that's, that's right out of the New Testament. If you go into a town, and you're offering up the true hope that you've been born anew to experience, and they don't want it, man, you walk out, take your sandals off, and, and, and slap them, knock the dust off your feet, and get on with living. And then grieve that they wouldn't take it. But you can't, you can't want something for someone more than they want it. And if you want something for someone more than they want it, you will get sick, and you will get stuck in their death spiral. you got to leave the dead to bury the dead. Even Jesus, when he went to his own hometown, um, it, I think it's in the book of Matthew, he went to his own hometown, or book of Mark, he went to his own hometown, and he says he was amazed at their lack of faith, their lack of hope, their lack of certainty, their lack of courage, their lack of willingness to take risks. He was amazed. He said he was, this is Jesus. Jesus was shocked. It means like, it means you've been slapped. Amazed is like, what is going on around here? Jesus was shocked. They wouldn't take anything. So he could do very little with them because there was no H-O-W or G-O-D in that society. They were still saying, uh, that's Mary's child. They're still telling that lie <coughs> about that virgin birth thing. And Nazareth. Okay, so with that said, I want you to know that, that you share your heart, especially in the beginning, while you're learning to have heart with people who have heart, okay? Especially when you're coming back to H-O-W plus G-O-D, you share your heart with people who have heart. In other words, they're humble enough and vulnerable enough to say, this is where I was, and that's usually embarrassing. And this is what happened, and that's usually revealing. And this is where I am now, and that's usually attractive. I want what you got. See, you got to want to get you got to be willing to ask to receive. You've got to be willing to seek to find. You've got to be willing to knock for the door to be opened unto you. A great documentary on knocking is an a Amazon original called Mully, M-U-L-L-Y. Get it, download it, watch it. The power of a knock changes a life. Okay. Now, with that said, in the garden, it was like God came into the garden and used a Hebrew word called ayika. And Ayika, when he came to the garden, everything had crashed. And the, we had it's like torn up what he had given us. And he came into the garden and said, where are you? Where are you? And it was a lament. It was like, oh, like, where are you? Now, I know God's omnipotent. <clears throat> I know God's omniscient. But God is a God of heart and a God of relationship and creation, a God of caring. Okay? So when he came to the garden, even though he knew the end, he knew what was going to happen, 
He knew what it was going to cost him, his son. He came in the garden in a lament, like crying over his children. Like, like guys, some of you have seen some pain in your children that you would do anything to change, whether it's an illness. My son had a spinal tumor, and uh, uh, we didn't know cancerous or not. Um, and uh, I remember when they pulled the gurney away to go to the OR, Sonia's, the sound of her voice wasn't a voice, it was the sound of an animal. It was, oh, like, like the, the longing, like, do not take him. Do not take my son. And then after the surgery, he was in so much pain, he didn't sleep for, for a long time except under, you know, narcotic haze. She couldn't find a place to touch him on his body that didn't hurt. And she finally found an end of his foot, four days sitting there and wouldn't leave except for eight hours. I couldn't drag her out, you know. And then she found a Bebo Norman tape, a Bebo Norman on his uh, uh, ear pods. She put Bebo, Bebo Norman, oh, great light of the world, trees, it's a, a, a Christian singer, put those in his ears, held them to his foot, and he slept, unaided by uh, med medication. So it's like this, this cry out, this call is very, very powerful. So God comes into the garden with that times 27 million exponential, times 27 million exponential, that kind of ache. Ayika is no simple phrase like, hey, where are you, man? It's, where are you? Because until you tell me what's going on inside of you, honest, open, and willing, and seek some good early direction, your ego is going to control everything from here on out. You're going to be in the league with everything that kills and destroys and eats things alive and steals. Like, oh, my God. Now, I got a plan for us, and Adam said, I was afraid. He became a child again. I was afraid. Oh, I'm still open and willing. I'm telling the truth. And so I, I hid because I was vulnerable, exposed. Uh, I didn't know what to do. I, was, I could see myself, and I had sinned. I'd done wrong. So I hid. <clears throat> and there's our problem. You either hide out or cry out. Hide out or cry out. H-O-W plus G-O-D is our cry out with the right people. So we can be released from the thing that keeps us isolated from each other and allows us to join with each other. With boundaries, with healthy boundaries. So sometimes you got to leave. Like, you can't treat me that way. That's not okay. i got to go. And you go. I don't, this doesn't mean you seek out harm because love doesn't seek out harm. Love's willing to hurt, but it doesn't seek out harm. Jesus has already done the harm part. Our jobs do the hurt part. Okay, now... So with all that said, here's, the, here's my uh, 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 thing. Okay, now, I want you to start writing down some words. You got the equation. And the, the, the first word is hesed, H-E-S-S-E-D. And Aaron, I may get off on this. I may, you may have to correct, ne you know, next Sunday. Okay, here are Chip Dodd's corrections. Because <laughs> I'm about to enter his, you know, it's his territory. I mean, he's trained beautiful man. And, and it was amazing how I got to be with Matt and Aaron and, and every conversation we had, everything we did, my, my sense of comfort and safety and care from them just rose. And as we were walking back last night, we went, we had fish and chips and Matt had a <coughs> healthier thing called boy, boy scallops. And uh, <laughs> he's our health nut, right? <laughs> For that night. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I said, man, I just, it's just been good with y'all. We just, you know, he said, it, well, Chip, being with you is just like, like we've already met you. So we were like, it was all there. And, and literally, literally, when we saw each other the first time, Aaron said, you're tall. I said, you are too. Because <laughs> he thought I'd be kind of like this tall or something, you know. So, all right, so hesed. Hesed is a word that we can't define in English. Just like where are you doesn't quite say what the truth is of a yika, A-Y-E-K-A, -E where are you? By the way, God asked that question from now on until the end of time, end of your time. He's every, every, all the time, he wants to know, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Hey, where are you? And our job is to be able to tell him where we are. But is that language, I'm on Fifth Street by Hampton? He goes, I already know that. I'm omniscient. And I'm going to go do this. He's going like, well, it's not going to work out well because I'm omnipotent. But he's not asking that. He's got that. He doesn't necessarily have us. 
See, that's the one thing we can take from him, is us. And what is it that we take from him? It's how we were born. We get rid of it, except we can't. You really can't get rid of hope. You can't get rid of your needs. You really can't get rid of your feelings. And you can't get rid of a desire for more. You can't get rid of longing for life to be better than it is. Like longing for justice and safety and home. I want to go home. E.T. go home. E.T. phone home. Y'all remember that? Somebody old enough? E.T. phone home. And millions and millions of people went to see that movie and they made billions of dollars over a sentence. I want to go home. And then some of you may never have heard of him, but Paul Bear Bryant was the, the, the coach for Alabama. Some of you probably hated him for years when he came up here and beat everybody, the University of Alabama football. But he did a commercial. His mother had passed away when he was young. And he does this commercial for Maul Bell. He's gruff and tough. And he says, I, y'all, it's Mother's Day. Y'all need to call home. I wish I could call home. And, and all these football players from the past get on the phone and call their mamas because Paul Bear Bryant told them to do it. So we want to go home. And you know, no matter how much we make it great here, still something missing. We came from a place we, went, we really are made to go back to. So this is temporary. Paul calls it, a, we wear a kind of a transient tent uh, and we live in a tent so we can go to a place that's never going to change. No, I don't mean never going to change like every day's the same. Where's the fun? I'm talking about never going to change in terms we're always cared for and safe. Everything we've been looking for we have so we can build anew, do all kinds of cool stuff. All right, so hesed means loving kindness, unending care, un, in, unable to not be, have compassion. I mean, I can go on and on. Goodness, uh, there's no way I can get away from you because I love you so much. Um, even if I get angry with you, I can't look at you and be disappointed. You're mine. I made you. You think I'd leave you? Are you crazy? No, I want you back. Hesed, loving kindness, unable to be any other way. The character of God is he could, but he won't be any other way. God is love. Hesed. And those words I use, they're, they're junk. And the people who brought us into the world, it was their job to introduce us to their introduction of hesed. And if they didn't have H-O-W plus G-O-D, they couldn't. Or, and they, if they didn't go learn it, they wouldn't. And if they wouldn't, then their, their, their ego was greater than, than how they were created. They gave up creation to have their way. And their way, promise you, doesn't turn out well for them, but the repercussions. Because you didn't come out of the womb looking for God. You came out of the womb looking for them. And it was their job to say, I'm a big old child. I'm going to raise a child. But I'm not the, I'm not the grown-up here. I'm just older. And we lose that humility, then we lose our capacity to connect with the people who need us. Okay, so with that said, God, that's God's love, so automatically we're suspicious. Now let's look at what the world has taught us versus what God is teaching us. The word obey, just like those sayings that we have, the word obey doesn't mean what we've been told. And a lot of biblical teachers teach us the world's definition of obey instead of the truth definition of obey. The word obey in the Old Testament is shama, S-H-A-M-A-H. Aaron will correct that later. You afterwards go say, Aaron, is that right? And you go, mostly. <laughs> so shama means to obey. Now, you and I were taught that obey means to do what you're told. True? That's not what it means. <clears throat> it doesn't mean do what you're told. It means to listen. It means literally, it means listen. The Old Testament, listen, 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 listen. Hey, listen, I got something I want to share with you. I got something I want to tell you. I got something I want to give you. I got something you need to know. I got something you need to watch out for. And so, and when you're born, the way we're created, do you know what you're listening for? You're listening for anything that's going to give you a life and life to the full. You're listening for the fulfillment of how you're made. And guess what fulfillment of how you're made? We're made to be 
connected and content in relationship. And out of that, we create and make and shape and take risks because we always have a place to go home to after we've taken that risk. So the word obey doesn't mean do. It means listen so that you can have. Have what? Behave. Well, behave. Behave, we've been told, means do like you ought to do. But that's not what the word means. Behave doesn't mean do what you ought to do. Behave means be have. Have your being. Be who you're made to be. That's what behave means. Well, how do I end up being who I'm made to be? By listening for words that show and teach me how to find the fulfillment I'm looking for from the one who loves. Okay? Now, that's where we get a problem. Now we've got a problem. I'm made to have full life, and I get that by learning to listen and listening to what I need to learn. And that's where we get the word, I need something greater than myself teaching me. And that's where we get the word authority. But what does the world tell us authority is? The world tells us that authority, the world tells us, and many biblical teachers will tell us from the beginning that authority means power over you. It's a thumb on your neck. Power over you. And do you know what? Have you ever been able to give your heart's trust, willingness, vulnerability, heartache, and pain to somebody that has their thumb on your neck? No. God knows that. We're not capable of giving our hearts to a power that doesn't seek our good. So I want you to know there are two kinds of authority in this life. There's the oppressive authority that seeks power over you, and then there's a thing called healthy authority. What is healthy authority? Healthy authority is power that seeks your good, desires your good, your fulfillment. Desires for your fulfillment. And that's where we get the word author, someone who writes words. Now, stay with me, guys. Stay with me. I'll wrap it up. We'll have lunch. But that's where, you know, like, lunch, lunch, okay, as long as we're having lunch, I'm good. But no, stay with me because this is huge. This is amazing. We take our words back, we get our lives back. If we let the world have our words, we continue to lose our lives, following the world, thinking it's God. It's not God. God's an author who's given us thousands of words to say, Seek life so that it may go well with you. I came to bring you life and life to the full. Life and prosperity, not death and curses. Blessed is the person who trusts in the Lord, who has confidence in God. Isolated is the person who depends upon their own flesh, who trusts in the power of man, whose heart has gone away from God. When the person who trusts in the Lord, who by testing God, test me, and you find out if I'm who I say I am. And you'll start seeing coincidences that you can't call incident call coincidence anymore because you have to call them God incidences. You start to see him and smell him and wonder when he's about to do something next and it might be good. And then you start to trust enough that when good doesn't come, you know it is coming. Because the word says, the author says, every single prayer that we pray, the answer from God is yes. It's right there in Corinthians. You ask Aaron. Now, it might look like no at first, but then that's where we have the capacity to call to wait. Wait, 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 wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. It's too much. It's too anxious. I can't wait. Okay. Trust, trust. Oh, how am I going to trust? Ask for help. Because neediness is the key. Neediness, asking for help, is the key that unlocks the treasure trove of God. Not your strength, not your good acts but you bringing who you are to who he is. Who are you? Created in his creation to find fulfillment through relationship with your heart being shared with others in him. Okay, so the word authority, author, I have words to give you so that you can have what you're made for. Now all of a sudden, I'm listening to the author's words so that I can act according to what will fulfill me now behave to, to have a full life. So obey and behave and authority mean brand new things. They mean what they've always meant. Now, we get the word surrender. Surrender, oh, that's defeat. That's not defeat. That's defeat in the world's uh, eyes. But what does the word mean? The word actually means give back. It means render over. It means bring it home. Like you took that out of my house. 
Now, I need you to bring it back. Surrender means render back over. Now, what is it that we took from the treasure house of God and ran off with? Well, what I ran off with was my heart. I figured he couldn't handle it. They couldn't do it. They weren't going to pay attention to it. I'll take it from here. And I'm going to be strong in body, mind, and spirit. I'm going to be religious. And then when religion ran out, uh, frankly put, other things took its place. Like, I'll make myself feel better, and I'll get the approval of God, I'll get the approval of people. I became addicted to people. What you thought of me mattered a whole lot more than what God thought of me, and I figured that God didn't think about me or think much more of me than you thought of me. So I was alone. And most of us, even sometimes, even from the pulpit, pulpit, live alone. Everybody needs help, and our expertise needs to be good at asking for it. So surrender means you bring back what you stole from me and hand it over. Okay? You get it? And every recovering person gets what that means. Yeah, man, I've got, I came to believe that there's a power greater than myself that can restore me to wholeness I've always sought. I think I'm going to obey so I can have my being, and I'm paying attention to the words of life so I can have my life. Behave, obey, surrender. That's a good word. Because it means I'm taking this and giving it back to you because you sought it. You sought it, and what you can do with it is a lot more than I can do with it. And he takes it, puts it back in there, and says, yoke yourself to me. I'm going where you go. And all you got to do is answer the question, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Stay connected to me. And that's how, you know, in, in, in Israel today, a parent, 64 years old, says, son, son, 40 years old, Aika, Aika. It's not, a, it's not a word that's just reserved for the Bible. It's a word of daily life. Where are you? I see your car is shiny. I see your job. I see your fancy suit. Where are you? Where are you in your heart? Sometimes Sonia will be sitting on the sofa. She goes, where are you? I'm going right here. And I know she wants the other. She says, where are you really? I'm like, what beautiful words. Where are you? Where are you? Like, in love? That's where I am. I'm in love all of a sudden. I was alone, and now I'm in love. Because you, you, you sought my heart. You sought my heart. You didn't seek my wares. You didn't seek my money. You didn't seek my performance. You sought me. So, man, we need to be seeking each other. And so many marriages kind of like pass away because we quit seeking each other. Because I sought you last, you didn't seek me. Now you seek me, and I seek like, you know, that kind of tit for tat. It becomes business. So surrender is not an ugly word. Now, here's the big thing, the coup de grace. Repentance. Okay, repentance. Now you're going to get ugly on us. No, this is the most beautiful word of all. Listen to this. Now, the world stole this word, and they use it to make fun of us, Christians. And then we earned them making fun of us because the wrong people were calling us calling to repentance. I'm not saying they were the wrong people, but they did it so poorly because they didn't understand what they were talking about. Admit how evil you are and come and Jesus is going to heal you. <laughs> knock it out of you. He wants to knock it out of you too. Like, well, I could do this out there. At least I can have my hands on the wheel instead of you taking the wheel because you're not taking me anywhere. This is just like I already thought it was going to be. You want power over me instead of to be present with me. No. Guys, listen to this. Repentance means come home. That's what it means. The real meaning of repentance. Isaiah 30, 15. And repentance and rest is your salvation. And repentance and rest is your Yahshua. Yeshua. Jesus. In other words, come on home. Listen, take those dirty clothes off. Man, you worn out. Like, it's ugly. Let me, let me wipe those wounds. You cut up. Rest. Rest. The sheets are clean. Food's on the table. The light's on. If you go out the door, the light's on. Table's set. I'm not going anywhere. I'm glad you're home. Come on home. Come home. Now, that's the invitation. Now, repentance also is very powerful. And, and that's how come recovering people get repentance better than anyone else. Recovering from what ails you 
so you can have recovery of who you're made to be. Because repentance ultimately means you set fire to the ships that you were traveling on and you leave them behind. In other words, you can't even get back. And you turn with what the heart is made to be because you've returned to how you're made and you haven't found anywhere else that's better. You can't, you can't get out. You can't get somewhere. There's got to be something more than this. So when we repent, we don't do it because we're good. And I, the prodigal son wasn't good. The prodigal son was swimming with pigs. And he just had a good idea. Hey, this is what I think I'm going to do. You go read the story of Luke 15. This is what I think I'm going to do. This is a good idea. I'm going to tell my father this. And then he goes home. And it says, while he was far away, the father saw him. And the father jumped up. He's the prodigal. The father's the prodigal. It means indulgent, luxurious. And he ran to the, to the, the, the pig feeder, ran to him. And he adorned him with a robe of royalty, a ring of a king, and then killed a lamb. who was a foretelling of the ultimate sacrifice. The father gave up everything to have the son who brought his heart home and didn't even know what he was doing. The father basically said, you know, I don't need your excuses. I don't need your, your just, I don't need your explanations. I need you. I want you. So I want you to know that repentance is beautiful. And, 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 and in recovery, recovery, the recovery process, step 10 is about doing daily repentance. It's like keeping up with the errors of our lives for our conscience's sake. So I can look at you and say, I'm sorry I did that. Or I can look at you and say, man, that was really good when I did that, right? And you go, yeah, that was good. Thank you again. Like, that's called coming home. Come home. Repentance. Come home. Burn those ships. Anything that takes you away from the life you're made to have in relationship with him and others, we need to repent of. Come on home. Come on home. And man, home's tough because it's not the ultimate place. But it beats where you've been if where you've been has kept you from the life you're made to have. Do you dare hope for so much? Do you dare believe so much? Do you dare risk so much? Only if you're hungry and you're thirsty and they run out of water. <laughs> it's not in our good name. It's in how he created us that we come back to. We are created as creatures of the heart who wind up being able to think. We need to be able to think about how to express what's happening in our hearts because what's in our hearts is what he's interested in. He's not all that big on us figuring out, you know, physical science. He's big on what you're doing it for, who's it going to bless, and how much joy you have in getting to do it. He's very interested in us. Hesed, 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 hesed. I love you. Hesed, I love you. You think I could stop loving you? You are so mistaken. You are so mistaken. When my son William came out in the recovery room, he had heard Sonia's, oh, Aika, where are you? Don't leave. Son, Aika, when he came into recovery, remember, he's still dazed. We were able to go back into the recovery room. And he said, we told him, I said, son, they got the tumor. It peeled right off your spinal uh, cord, uh, like silly putty, they said. You're going to be okay. And it, it tears were rolling down his face. He said, that's good. I was so scared. But before we got to him and before we spoke those words to him, when he came out in recuperation, the nurses were leaning over him. And the first thing he said was, how's my mama? How's my mother? I mean, that's how we're created. That's how we're created to stay connected. He trusted the pain of his mother's love to the point that he ended up being concerned for his mother's pain when he had a scar running down his back and was barely able to talk. And then he had the tears of life. Good, I was so scared that I would not walk again. I mean, all of that sad and tragic and all of it's redeemed and beautiful because all of us were answering the question, where are you? I was saying, where are you? Sonia was saying, where are you? He was saying, where are you? And now I can share what where are you can do for all of us. But if you don't speak it, 
you live alone. If you speak to the wrong people, get away. If you have the right people, don't ever leave. Stay home. Come on home. It's in your name we pray, Jesus, for this time. I thank you for every person in this room. May the Lord bless us. May the Lord keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us. Our hearts are made for him. Our hearts are made for each other. Our hearts are made to be full of the life we have. Let's live it. Let's dare to live it through H-O-W plus G-O-D so we can dispense with our egos and have the selves that are made to rise up and live fully with fruit hanging on our limbs so others can pick it and start to trust again themselves. It's in your holy name we pray, Jesus. Amen.